Buddha started and ended his teaching with the issue of how to put an end to suffering. And it's easy to agree with him that this is an important issue to address. Some people, though, wonder if that's all he addresses. Just put it into suffering? Well, what else is there? Aren't there bigger issues in life? But it was a part of the Buddha's genius to realize that if you put an end to suffering, you learn a lot of other things about the mind. If you focus on the issue of suffering, a lot of things are brought right there together. Because right where there's feeling, there's also attention and intention, perception. Particularly intention. One of the big questions that really stares you in the face when you think about the Buddha's teachings on intention and causality, how your intentions shape the world, is his insistence on the one hand that events from the past are having influence on the present, but that they don't have a total influence. That you have some freedom of choice in the present moment. Where, where does that freedom of choice come from? What is that freedom? You've got lots of potentials coming up from the past, things that you could obsess about and make yourself thoroughly miserable. Or there are potentials for pleasure. If you focus on those, you can make yourself happy. You have the choice. And there's some freedom in there. In fact, if you explore that freedom, the more you explore the freedom, the, the more you see of the mind's potential for freedom. Because this is what everything is aimed at, is freedom, total freedom. And our small taste of freedom in the present moment is noticing when we have freedom of choice. We can go one way or the other. Most of us don't take advantage of that. We have old habits old feeding habits, and we just keep feeding away the way we always have been without really thinking about it. Which means we stay in our old ruts. The Buddha said that he himself got onto the path to the end of suffering. But he noticed that he could choose which way to think, and his thoughts fell into two sorts. There were thoughts that led to harm for himself and for others. And there were thoughts that led to no harm to anybody. The first type of thoughts were thoughts imbued with sensuality, i.e. sensual desire, sensual passion, ill will, cruelty. Whereas there are thoughts that were not under the power of any of these things. And you realize that you could exert some control to stop the unskillful thoughts. You could beat them back, as he said. He compared it to being a cow herd. Back in those days, you'd had small herds of cattle. And during the rainy season, you wanted to make sure they didn't get into your neighbor's rice fields. And if you saw them heading off into the rice fields, you'd have to beat them back. And you realized that you could do the same with your unskillful thoughts. Skillful thoughts didn't have any drawbacks aside from the fact that they could make you tired. And the issue is when you get tired is it's very hard to fight off the unskillful thoughts. So with that realization, he learned to bring the mind into concentration. That's a way of giving the mind a place to rest and giving it a standpoint from which you could watch those thoughts. Because the only way you're going to be able to see thoughts as events is if you're able to step outside them, not get sucked into those thought worlds. Because once you're in the world, you see everything colored by the opinions of that world, the values of that world. So you need a place where you can step outside. This is what we're doing as we develop the path. You know, so when the Buddha taught about suffering, it wasn't just suffering. He had four noble truths. 
You try to comprehend the suffering to see what it's like, to see what it really is like to suffer. What's actually happening when you're suffering? What's happening around the pain? Then when you see the issues that are actually giving rise to mental suffering, you let them go. Now to do that you requires strength. One, to be able to sit long enough with the pain, with the stress, with the suffering, so you can really see it. And the only way we can do that is if you don't feel threatened by it. So you need a standpoint, and that's what the path provides. That's why we develop the path. We're not here just to look willy-nilly at whatever comes up. We have to realize there are potentials here in the present moment that can strengthen us, give us a sense of well-being. One, so that we don't just get sucked into unskillful thoughts, and two, so that we can analyze them, observe them from outside. So this teaching on learning how to abandon unskillful thoughts, to allow skillful thoughts to develop within reason, but also to find a place for the mind to settle down and stay with concentration, mindfulness, alertness. This parallels two of the, the Buddha's more formal teachings. One is the relationship between what he calls mundane right resolve and transcendent right resolve. Mundane right resolve is simply the desire or the determination that you're not going to give in to sensuality. You're not going to give in to ill will or cruelty, any of the factors that create unskillful thoughts. Transcendent right resolve is when you bring the mind into a state of concentration where you really have put sensuality aside. As I say, you're secluded from sensuality. Sensual thoughts just don't impinge on the mind at that point. You're not interested. You've got something better. But the Buddha's description of this way of dealing with thoughts also parallels the seven factors for awakening. You keep in mind the fact that you don't want to get sucked into your thoughts, and so you develop the breath or the body in and of itself as your frame of reference. Any thoughts that would pull you into thought worlds, you put aside. You get worked up either about something you want in the world or something you get up as you upset about the world, learn how to just put it aside. Learn how not to get into that thought world. It's like seeing a dream world come up in your mind and realizing, hey, this is a dream. If you let yourself get into it, you forget that you're in the dream. And you can get happy or sad, entertained or frightened by the events in the dream. And there comes a point, though, when you realize, hey, this is a dream. You wake up. Those are the worlds in the mind. And sometimes it's hard to tell that they're dreams because they correspond to issues that are actually happening outside in your daily life. But the Buddha says, for the sake of learning how not to get sucked into them, you have to realize, okay, that's just world, and learn to think of it, just world. You've got something bigger in here. You've got the issues of your own mind. We tend to make the world bigger than us, but we have to learn how to make this question of how to overcome suffering bigger than the world. That's what we're doing as we try to maintain this frame of reference the breath in and of itself. And based on that, you see things arising and passing away, thoughts arising and passing away. And you learn how to judge them as skillful or not. This is the second factor for awakening, which is called analysis of qualities. You see the qualities that surround your thinking. There's greed, aversion, and delusion. You recognize that. That's an unskillful thought. You're seeing it simply as an event, part of a process. You're not concerned about how well it's representing the world to you, or whether it's telling you something you need to get worked up about. For the time being, you're not. It's just 
That's a thought. And like the cowherd, if it's an unskillful thought, you learn how to keep it in check. This is the effort or the persistence, which is the third factor for awakening. And as you really stick with this, you can bring the mind to states of concentration, the concentration you need in order to maintain this stance of being able to step outside your thoughts. And the factors for awakening this is described as rapture, serenity, concentration, equanimity, the qualities you need so that you don't get sucked in, so you have the strength not to get sucked in. so that you can maintain that process of learning how to abandon anything that's unskillful. You have your own separate place to stay, so that when suffering or stress, any kind of dis-ease comes up in the mind, you don't have to feel threatened by it. You can look at it, recognize it as an event. And not get tied into the storylines and the narratives. This is about your family. This is about your co-workers. This is about your whatever. It's a thought. It's a mental state. If you recognize it as unskillful, then you try to draw on whatever resources you should develop through your meditation. So you can pull yourself out, at the very least not fall under its power. At the best, learn how to understand it. Where is this coming from? What kind of assumptions is it based on? The Buddha talks about the events in the mind in a cluster. There's, as I said, intention, attention, perception, and feeling. So you learn how to look at the labels. How are you labeling the issue? That's the perception. What do you want out of the issue? That's the intention. What are you paying attention to? The Buddha says, try to pay attention just to this issue that there is stress. Where is the stress? Watch it. Comprehend it. Figure out what the cause is so you can abandon it. Realize that you don't have to suffer this stress. This is why the Buddha puts the cessation of stress third there in the Four Noble Truths. Some people wonder, well, why don't you put the path and then as a third truth, and then the cessation as a fourth truth. Well, to gain the energy or to have the energy to follow the path, you have to be convinced that it is possible to get beyond this stress, the suffering. Just as when the doctor says, okay, it is possible to be cured of this disease, and you're willing to listen to the course of treatment, because sometimes those courses of treatment can be pretty, pretty devastating. And if you're not convinced that they're actually going to cure you, you're not going to want to follow the course. So the Buddha says, whatever suffering is weighing down the mind is totally unnecessary. It can be cured. It can be put in it. It can be ended. <clears throat> so that gives you the energy to develop all the qualities that are required in the path. It'll give you the strength. It'll give you the powers of endurance so that when the issue comes up that you don't understand, you can watch it for however long it takes. Well, this is called appropriate attention. The Buddha tends to tie those two qualities together, the set of seven factors for awakening and appropriate attention. Because that's what the analysis of qualities is. So you try to pay appropriate attention to these issues of skillful and unskillful thoughts and what can be done with them. in a way that really does finally uproot them. It includes the qualities that you need that you need to develop in order to have the strength to watch these things, have the strength to abandon the things that you've been doing for so long but are unskillful. Because it does take strong resolve. Many is the time when you've pulled out all the tricks you've learned from the Buddha about how to deal with, say, lust or anger, and none of them seem to be working. There's still a 
strong insistence in the mind. It just wants to go in these directions. No reason at all, just strong, strong, strong desire. We have to be strong in your resistance. This is why conviction is such an important part of the path. Conviction that the Buddha didn't really know what he was talking about, that you will be better off if you don't give in to these unskillful thoughts. So it's useful to reflect on this teaching. The Buddha said got him started on the path, recognizing he could see his thoughts as events, as factors that lead either to happiness or lead to suffering. That he could step back from his thinking, he had the freedom to choose what kind of thinking he was going to follow. That's an important assumption right there. The Buddha regarded it as so important that it was the one issue that he would actually seek out and argue with other teachers, teachers who taught determinism, that everything was totally predetermined, there's nothing you could do, or that everything in the world was so chaotic that there was nothing you could figure out. He'd actually seek them out to refute them. Because that principle that you do have freedom of choice is so central to putting an end to suffering. He said, if you can't take that as your assumption, you're left bewildered and without protection. Which relates to that old analysis of how people react to suffering. They, they get bewildered by the suffering and then they look to somebody else to help them. But if you assume that nothing can be done about it, that's it. You stay bewildered and you have no protection. But if you're convinced that you do have this freedom to choose, there is an element of choice in your suffering. Then you can choose not to suffer. That's simply making the choice. It's not enough. It requires building on that and all the other skills of learning how to watch, learning how to develop concentration. Those are all necessary. But they build on that conviction that you do have this freedom to choose not to suffer. And as you explore that freedom, this element of choice you have in the present moment, you find that it opens up into deeper kinds of freedom. What the Buddha calls this deathless dimension. It's totally free of stress. lies totally beyond space and time. If you dig into the issue of suffering and you do it skillfully, you open up to this much larger issue as well. So many times we come to the practice concerned about issues in our family, issues at work, just trying to straighten out our lives on an ordinary level. But the Buddha says, okay, as you straighten that out, you can dig deeper into those same issues. Why is there suffering? What can be done about it? And you find that it takes you really far. <laughs>